Welcome to Purposeful Empathy, a show dedicated to conversations with people who want to grow and spread empathy throughout the world. So welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today I'm joined by the fabulous Gwen Yi, who is in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and she is the founder of Tribeless. She founded it in 2016 with a dream to create safe spaces in our everyday lives where we can skip the small talk and see the human first. Welcome to the show, Gwen. Nice to see you. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much for having me. Well, so I know today you, Tribeless is an education company that teaches empathy skills in a tangible, practical way. And you're the proud creators of the Empathy Box, a physical tool. Yeah, show it to our, oh, brilliant. <laughs> Great. It's a physical tool that facilitates empathic conversations and it's impacted thousands of people around the world with your tools and your training. I'm so excited to have you on the show and ask you some questions, but could we start with the backstory, please? Would you share how this all came to be? Yeah. Okay. So the story starts about more than four years now, actually. I always say four years ago, Um, but I think I'm coming up to about my fifth year now. Uh, So five years ago, in San Francisco. Uh, I was there for university, uh, uh, specifically a new kind of university. So there wasn't much like support structures in place. But at that time, I really had, I think, a go-getter kind of mindset, like hustler, you know, who gives a crap about well-being, empathy, what's all that? Um, I really wanted to kind of make my career in tech. Uh, So from, you know, at at the time I was about 21 years old, I went all the way to the US, first time living so far away from home. And what I didn't expect uh, in making this huge kind of transition in my life is how much I would need the support, the emotional support and also social support of the people around me. So there I was, you know, uh, alone in this strange land. And I was struck with what was probably the worst mental health crisis of my life. So I had depression, I had anxiety, I had like panic attacks when people knocked on my door. And it got to a point where I was actually contemplating, should I continue staying in this place, you know, in this city um, that had been my dream, but nothing was like what I had imagined and instead drop out and come back home to Malaysia. So I think, you know, when I tell this story, um, to give context, I think dropping out right now is like all the hype. Everyone's like, oh yeah, like you don't need a, a degree to survive. But at that time, I think, you know, five years ago in Malaysia, there was still a lot of stigma around dropping out and, you know, not pursuing tertiary education. And I think specifically around mental health as well. So it wasn't just that big decision that kind of disrupted my emotional state. But more than that, it was the idea that I had all this shame right now in making this decision that I couldn't talk about to the people around me. Um, So I was just carrying this this weight inside of me. And it was at that moment that I realized, oh my goodness, relationships are important. You know, talking about things are important. But of course, I I didn't have that space. So I started hosting, uh, after a few months, dinner parties. Dinner parties with strangers. Um, And at these dinner parties, there was one explicit rule. No small talk. So I was really sick of meeting, you know, people from my life and them asking me, hey, what's up? You know, what are you up to now? And not being able to answer, you know, like, oh, yeah, I'm doing this cool stuff. But like, oh, um, I actually am a dropout. You know, I have no idea what I'm doing with my life. And oh, by the way, I'm depressed. Right. So I was finally in this space that almost I had engineered for myself. that I could finally start to open up about these things that I had previously not had the space to talk about anywhere else in my life. Um, So one dinner party became another and another. And slowly, not only did I start to heal, but I also started to heal my ideas around vulnerability and empathy and shame. And I I started to open up more. The people around me who were attending the dinners started to open up as well. And so I think I was hosting dinner parties for about two to three years. And it was in that whole process that I started to notice, hey, I think there are some patterns into how these people were gathering, right? For some reason, even though we were from you know, different backgrounds, like different walks of life, you know, different ages, et cetera, et cetera, um, with the same formula, with the same kind of process, each of us were able to kind of feel a sense of psychological safety that enabled us not only to open up with each other, but to also get real with ourselves. And that led to a lot of change 
uh, you know, both personal and I guess in some sense, professional change. And uh, that process eventually was led to the creation of the empathy box, um, which is a physical tool, kind of like a physical manifestation of those processes that we were using to create the space for safety in the dinner parties. Um, but this story is four years old, five years old. And I think along the way, what we learned as a company, as, as an organization, was that empathy was the key to creating these safe spaces. When we were doing it, we really had no idea what I was doing, what we were doing. You know, we were just bringing people together to kind of have a good time. Um, but eventually, as we started to get more, I guess, critical about it, more analytical, we started to notice, oh, so this experience of people listening to each other and kind of trying to understand where that other person was coming from. And not only doing that, but expressing and responding to them in a way that made them feel heard and understood. And that also enabled you to open up and feel understood. That whole process was empathy. And so I think that's how we eventually evolved into becoming an empathy company in which right now we have the, you know, the tools and also the training that's currently in progress um, that we're developing to kind of teach these practical, tangible empathy skills to anyone who's seeking for it around the world. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, you, what you're saying makes, reminds me, I'm not going to get the quote right, but apparently there's a thing, because I'm writing a book, mm -hmm. That th mm. that's known among authors, which is you write the book you need to read. And it sounds to me like you created the organization and the tool that you needed. Um, did, so yeah. congrats on the courage for having that first um, dinner party with strangers. Now, okay, so we, ha we know at a high level what the empathy box is meant to do and why it's an important tool, but could you just maybe walk us through a little bit of the mechanics of how it plays out? At, um, yeah. Should I open it? Like, sure. I... <laughs> um, yeah. So the empathy box, I mean, mine's really messy, so I'm not going to open it, but essentially it's a deck of cards. And I don't know if you have this, Anita, this is like the latest version. Um, so essentially how we think of it is that a conversation can be broken down into three main kind of parts, right? The beginning, the middle, and the end. So when it comes to the beginning, we believe it's really important to kind of set the kind of set the expectations and set the space. So we always start with the principal cards. And this is kind of creating a, almost rules of engagement that everybody in the conversation can commit to. So they are to share honestly, to listen openly, and to respond kindly. So we always start the conversation with these three things. And of course we do elaborate a little bit, but that kind of like sets the container. And then once everyone's like, okay, yeah, we agree. Then we always start with the opening question. Um, which is, what are your expectations for this conversation? Obviously, this question can take on many other forms, uh, but what we really like to see is to get everybody in the room talking. I mean, not everyone in the room, but everyone in the group talking so, so that they can actually um, start to get a sense of what everyone else's expectations are. So they, they're not like walking in blind, you know, they're like, oh, what's this <laughs> random conversation? Um, but everyone kind of knows what to expect. And then there's also the closing question, which I mentioned the container, but that comes at the end. And then we have the middle. So the middle is where we actually practice the empathy kind of back and forth. Um, so we always start with choosing a word. And the word is what each individual wants to talk about, but perhaps doesn't have the vocabulary to naturally arrive at on their own. So these are things like hope, identity, change. So it's, it's like a bunch of 20 words. I think we spent about like 800, 800 hours testing it. Um, so each word is chosen by the storyteller, we call them storytellers. So in the group, there are storytellers and listeners and everyone takes turns playing either role. So once the storyteller chooses their word, it's their time to kind of just share what they want to share about that word. So this is what I meant by the middle. And once the storyteller is done sharing, um, we have these five cards called the response cards. Um, and this is where I think empathy skills really come into play because it's with these five cards, uh, just really quickly, show some love, help me understand, share an observation, offer an alternate perspective, and finally the wild card. It's with these five cards um, that you actually get to practice empathy while listening and responding to the storyteller. So in a group situation, typically not everyone gets the chance to listen and share equally. And I think that's something facilitators or maybe educators struggle with a lot. 
So with the empathy box, it naturally creates a space where the group almost self-regulates so that everyone has a chance to really open up and share. And everyone also has a chance to respond very intentionally, I would say, very intentionally and empathically using the response cards. And so this kind of goes back and forth until everyone has had a chance to share or you run out of time. And then you close the group with the closing question. And usually this goes as, what did you appreciate about this conversation? So that is like a really, really basic kind of empathy box conversation. Um, but I think this manifests in different ways. Like our community around the world has gotten really creative with how they use it, especially nowadays with COVID, you know, you may not be able to gather in person. Yeah, so we're slowly building our membership, our, our community membership of people who are interested in kind of practicing different ways of practicing empathy online. Now, I'm dying to dig into sort of how you're managing given <laughs> uh, the whole online uh, scenario, but just yeah. as a bit of feedback, because I've, I own the empathy uh, box and, and I've used the cards in two different contexts. One was a few, like Christmas a couple of years ago, was invited yeah. to my uncle's house in the cottage, you know, my sister's oh my family, gosh. cousins. Showing love my, for that. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so I brought the, the, the deck with me. And uh, for those who were interested, I think we were five or six at a dinner table. We wa talked well into the night oh and I got to know my cousins differently. My mother and I had like kind of a bit of a breakthrough conversation. Wow. Uh, my uncle and his kids had a breakthrough conversation because when oh. you're listening without the intention of responding and being triggered, there's a, mm. an openness that kind of shows up where there's a generosity to actually really listen, li like listen, yeah, empathically. I guess that's the only way to frame it. But so, <laughs> I know, um, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that was one context. But the other context yeah. was I was invited to give like an empathy talk at a big uh, event where um, over 150 people from a team in an organization wow. were gathering and they were trying to do a bit of strategic thinking around um, wellness within their organization. So I gave a keynote mm -hmm. and then we actually facilitated, a, you know, at tables with, you know, eight or 10 mm. people at a table that we used the, the deck as well. And wow. so it can be used in a corporate setting and it can be used among strangers and friends and the most intimate relationships. So I just think it's a very powerful tool. So I just want to acknowledge Thank you so that. Much. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my gosh. I, I have so much to talk about for that, but yeah. Really? Do you, I love what, it. What, would you, what would you like to respond? Yeah. What would you like to say to that? Oh no. It's just that like, as you know, every time I hear a story about how someone has used the empathy box, in the wild, so to speak, right? I just get chills because so much of, of me, like you mentioned, like it's the book I wanted to read, right? Or like the book I wish I had read. So, so much of me is in the empathy box and it's such like, a, it's a physical product, right? It's not like online. You know, nowadays everything's online. So even if you launch something, it doesn't feel real. But the empathy box, whenever someone talks about how it has impacted them or how they've used it and how it's changed their relationships, I just get chills because Every time I send one out, it feels like a piece of me is kind of going out into the world. But when I hear stories like this, it's like that piece is coming back and I feel, oh, I'm getting chills. Like I feel like nourished by these stories. So thank you so much for sharing that. Well, you deserve all the kudos because I really feel you in the box too. You know, that this was oh. not sort of like, let's be an entrepreneur and how can I milk this like <laughs> empathy thing that's on the ascension in some circles, right? So I get <laughs> yeah. that. But uh, just a quick follow up question before we talk about your the online mm. um, direction things are going for the moment. Um, for those who are sort of like you're speaking to the choir who kind of get this empathic <laughs> stuff because they've been trained in humanistic or, or psychology yeah. Um, yeah. and are or open to the warm and fuzzies. What would you say to the people who find that like, oh, I don't want to share too much or, oh, that's a risk I don't want to take or I don't want to be too exposed or I don't want to speak to strangers. Like, how, what would you say to that? I think the strangers thing is more of a boundary thing as in like, personally, I don't feel comfortable. Um, I think there were people in my life, like my sister or my mom who, who just didn't feel comfortable doing it with strangers. Um, but I think I can share from the perspective of my mom. Um, so my mom, even though I'm the creator, it took me about a year and a half or maybe two years to finally do a session with my mom simply because she was just so 
totally against it. And I think it was very deeply ingrained in the Asian culture. Um, I think they call it kind of like not airing your dirty laundry um, in, in the Western context, right? Like, you know, keep the skeletons in the closet where they belong sort of thing. And they just, like my mom absolutely had no conception on why is it important to share? Like it just, it wasn't a part of her psyche, her way of being, <laughs> her way of communicating at all. Um, but it was through several conversations in which we slowly, slowly, slowly started to get her warming up to the idea of sharing um, that she finally, finally had a breakthrough on what it meant for her. Because my mom was the kind of woman where, you know, if you don't get her the first time she says something in her own way, she's like, whatever, you know, you're wasting my time. I'm not going to bother explaining it to you. And because of the power dynamics in Asian culture in which, you know, when there's elders, you should respect them, right? So if your mom says whatever, you know, screw off, you have to. Um, I think it was very conscious on my part to actively challenge that because I knew I wanted a relationship with her that was genuine and that was real and that was intimate. And so it was very conscious on my part to tell her like, hey, mom, I know this doesn't make sense to you right now. It's like totally unlike anything you've ever experienced. But please trust me in that when we do this together, because at that point I had already done it with, like you mentioned, so many strangers, so many different people. If you can just trust me to just go through this process with me, I really, really hope that it can contribute to our relationship. And you know what? Mom doesn't love her daughter, right? So I think it was through that process that she slowly warmed up to the idea. And now she's a total evangelist. And not just because she's my mom, um, but because like she herself had gone through the process like a few times. And every time she was like, wow, insights, wow, breakthrough. Wow, I finally understand how to talk to someone. You know, in the past, it's like, oh, if I don't get through to you, I guess we're just not meant to have a relationship. Or I guess we're just not meant to communicate with each other anymore. Um, and that was very hurtful to me. So I think we were touching a little bit about that just now. Um, it was really hurtful to me because I wanted so much to have a really authentic, open relationship with my mom. Um, but because she was clinging so tight to these old ideals, like there just wasn't any space. I think you mentioned space, no openness in the relationship for either of us to grow. But it was finally through, you know, in the practice, I would say, of empathy and listening as we were slowly working through things together that we both realized, oh, wow, we both want it just as badly. We just didn't really have the same shared vocabulary or the same way of looking at things. But now that we were able to work through things and we both realized we want the same things, then it was a lot easier for us to kind of arrive on the same page and say like, hey, I can tell you things that are hurtful to you. You can tell me things that are hurtful to me. But in that process of us sharing, we know that there is an end goal that we're working toward, which is our relationship to make it better. And I think, yeah, it was just through that repeated exposure of the process that my mom finally opened herself up to it. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that story. That raises two immediate questions. So one is sort of, <laughs> I'm asking on behalf of my, my students, right? So I'm, I yeah. teach at McGill and I, I've got students that are sort of like in their 20s, early, early 20s. And mm. um, I sense that some of them feel beholden to sort of either social structures or expectations or family pressures to differing degrees and and mm. you manage to you know transcend a lot of cultural expectations and familial kind of boundaries How, what mm. gave you the courage to kind of do that so I, I, I would like to ask on their behalf um, mm. and then the second question where you kind of illuminated that there's a lot of personal benefits and relationship yeah. benefits from this um, uh, this dialogue process and this empathic process. Mm. But I wonder if you could also mm. comment at sort of 64,000 feet up, like why you think <laughs> this is so needed right now in the world. Oh my goodness. Okay, um, I'll answer the first one. So the first one is because, you know, my friends have a joke. They call me hashtag white inside. <laughs> So like, I'm basically a white woman on the inside. Maybe that's why we get along. Um, but, but jokes aside, I really think that it's kind of due to the exposure that I had uh, from a young age to like Western culture, American culture. Um, you know, the, the idea of a third culture kid. I mean, I've always lived in Malaysia my whole life. Uh, but I really think that through this exposure, through media and such, I really feel like I straddle two cultures. 
I sometimes feel like I don't know my culture enough, like my Malaysian Chinese culture. Um, and, I, and, so, and I sometimes feel like I know like North American culture, or Western culture more. So I think it was naturally through that process in not having my own cultural identity, so to speak, that I started building an identity of my own. So it's really getting to know what my values are, what I wanted out of life. And of course, very much thanks to the relationships and the support that I was getting from like my team, the people around me. So not like my immediate family, who, who were the people I had to uh, encourage, so to speak, um, but from like my boyfriend who, who runs Tribalist with me, you know, my team, etc. And so it was really through that kind of shared courage so to speak of like oh you're doing it oh okay you know you're doing it oh okay yeah I think I can do it too (laughs) and like what do I have to lose right because I knew the current status quo wasn't working in a sense that I didn't know what I could do I didn't know what was right but I knew that this I'm not happy with this and I think that had plagued me my whole life I think uh, yeah I'm not really sure how much of it has to do with cultural influence as in like through the media Uh, But what I do know is that from a very young age, I've always craved for more. I've always craved for deeper connections, deeper relationships, and the kind of, uh, I guess, smoke and mirrors (laughs) type of relationship that uh, I think in general, Chinese culture or Asian culture is very happy with, you know, like, oh, just like, "Mm, if you're not happy, just kind of like play around the issue or, you know, just like deal with it. You don't actually have to raise it up. Like things like that, which is really, really, really implicit in the culture. It's it's not very spoken about. Um, I knew I wasn't happy with that. Yeah. So it was through that process of realizing, I guess, what I'm not happy with that I, uh, I think, you know what they say? Like when the pain is too great, you know, (laughs) that's what actually drives you to action. (laughs) Yeah. So I think I just had been living with pain my whole life. Um, So it really depends on what your tolerance is. My tolerance for interpersonal pain is really low in a sense that if I value my relationship with you and I feel like our relationship is on the rocks, I'm like on it instantly. (laughs) I'm like, you know, I I ditch my work, I ditch my health, everything. Like I'm on it, right? Because I think that's how much relationships mean to me. So it's about, I guess, knowing what what matters to you and what what lengths you're willing to go to for that. Yeah. I hope that answers the first question. Beautiful, beautiful. (laughs) And the second question, honestly, I don't know if I can answer it because I've been thinking about this a lot. And I think Tribus's approach to empathy is unique in that we really only look at it from that like grounded perspective. So you mentioned 6,000 feet up, right? Like 6,400, wait, 64,000 feet up. 64,000, yeah. Yeah. Like... I feel like I really can only look at it from the ground, like where I'm standing, because that is my lived experience. Like I'm not a PhD. I I didn't even get a college degree. You know, like all my experiences with empathy are lived in the sense that like it was through doing this work, slogging it through on the grassroots level that I realized, oh, this is empathy. Oh, it's important. And the more I did it in my own life, like I mentioned with my mom or, you know, basically with everyone around me, the more I realized just how important it was to actually turn it into a actionable, tangible practice, right? Because we can talk about it, like, I guess, on a socio-political level. Um, But when it comes to applying it to our everyday lives, like how empathetic are we to our spouses, to our teammates, to our friends, right? Because I think the biggest trap in empathy is we don't extend it enough to the people we're closest to, simply because those are the easiest you know, the easiest to overlook, the easiest to take for granted. Um, And so I don't, I don't think I can answer your question on that 64,000 feet level, because the way I see empathy is on, on the ground at eye level. (laughs) So that's a perfect segue to how is the empathy box playing out in a virtual world? Everything's online, COVID. So how, how have you managed to reinvent yourself? Yeah, that's a great question. So I'm going to open my messy box. Um, I think the, the interesting thing about the world today is that it is so easy yet so difficult <laughs> to find your footing in a virtual world. So in the past, there was kind of like the virtual market and then there was the physical market and then you kind of picked where you wanted to play game and then you stuck to your lane, right? Stay in your lane. Um, but because of COVID, every, everyone and everything moved online and I, I guess we had to figure out whether we wanted to you know, go with the flow or basically sink, right? 
um, thankfully, we decided to go with the flow. So it was really much thanks to our user community, uh, people who have the empathy box like yourself, who were like messaging us throughout the first lockdown. This was around April, May. Um, so they were messaging us like almost every day. Hey, like, can you guide me on how to use my empathy box online? You know, like I'm, I'm separated from my family. I'm separated from my lover. Like, you know, can, can you help me figure this out? And we were like, wow, okay. Like maybe we're onto something here. So we started experimenting with basically how do you turn physical cards like this into something that anyone around the world can replicate, right? With materials in their own house. Of course, figuring out how to simplify the structure so that it was still like effective, but also suitable for our online audience. And so this took around like maybe three to four weeks of R&D and we actually launched a global campaign online for anyone, uh, regardless whether they are Empathy Box users or not, to see if they can actually experiment with creating online safe spaces, we called it, uh, using the Empathy Box format, uh, but with you know, people online. So people had like specific groups in mind, like, oh, I want to connect with my old high school classmates. Oh, I want to do it with my family. Oh, I want to do it with my, uh, my, my team who is like, everyone is working remotely. And once they had the idea of who they wanted to do it with, they would actually use the Empathy Box format, but we, we had tailored it to an online uh, kind of process. We called it Empathy Circles, you know, just for simplicity's sake. And we let them free. So. We did a training, we did a briefing, we gave them the slides and we were like, go, you know, have fun. All we ask of you is to tell us the feedback, right, on how this played out. In total, almost 600 people joined over 30 days from 40 countries, which is like insane <laughs> because we had never had any kind of impact like that. I think that really opened up our eyes to the power of online in the sense that, wow, like there really is a hunger for this and not just a hunger, but I think a lot of capacity in a sense that because these guys like they're not trained facilitators some of them were actual strangers who came across our campaign and were like yeah I want some human connection and on average uh, based on the feedback form all the participants gave their ad hoc trainers 1.9 out of 10 which is like wow either like they're all really secretly good or this process is so foolproof that anyone right. can do it <laughs> And people are able to have really, really deep, amazing connections. So we're like, okay, let's go with the latter. Um, and then so we, we started event, uh, uh, experimenting more and more with the format, uh, slowly tweaking it to become online workshops, online courses, which currently we're still rolling out and testing uh, in private. But hopefully soon we, start, we hope to start offering it to corporates, you know, to, to the public, so that more people can really, really not just experience the power of human connection online, but the power of empathy in action, right? Being able to see like this really intangible concept being turned into a set of practical skills that you can see, you can learn, you can measure, and that you can practice. I think that's something that is really exciting for us. And the more that we iterate on this workshop and this training, uh, the more that we're starting to see that this is possible. So... Exactly. Now you say you're moving in the direction of education or you, you consider yourself like an education company. Could you maybe unpack that a little bit? Like what your, what your why that is the focus? That's a good point. Maybe we have different definitions of education. Um, but I think when we look at education, we mean like training and education in the sense that all this while we have been really focused on, you know, like tools, um, physical products. And then we realized, oh, okay, you can't just give someone a toolbox and expect them all to be carpenters. Like we need to teach them carpentry skills. <laughs> I think especially here in, in Asia where there's like significantly lower exposure to social, social emotional skills. Um, so yeah, in general, like things like listening, things like communication, it's not really well known. And so as we start to do this work more and more, we're like, oh, we wanted to teach you empathy, but it seems like the basics of you know, communication and <laughs> learning how to listen, like you mentioned, learning how to not be triggered when someone else's response to you, and like things like that, we realized that it needed to be taught. And the more workshops and trainings that we ran, the more we realized, oh, it can be taught. And so that's why we're slowly, slowly trying to move into that space. Yeah. So you can imagine teaching it to, y to younger children <laughs> yeah. as well. Can you envision working with schools or school boards? Is that the... <sighs> 
I mean, at the moment, we do focus more on like adult learning. Um, mm-hmm. The youngest I think that we've worked with is, I mean, we haven't worked directly with them, but we were doing this campaign. Um, it was a really interesting campaign. It's called Stand Together. It's an anti-bullying campaign that is supported by the Ministry of Education in Malaysia. Uh, it's being rolled out digitally um, to uh, 750 schools across Malaysia. So um, it's a campaign that teaches empathy and kindness as skills in um, in response to bullying. So instead of saying like, no, bullying is bad, like <laughs> they're kind of like starting at the root of it to say like, hey, you know, let's try empathizing with each other. Do you know why this person's bullying? You know, let's try to put ourselves in their shoes, like things like that. Uh, so we helped design the empathy workshop for this. And currently it's being trained. Well, it just ended, but it was trained to over, I think 2000 students around Malaysia. Um, so these were students around like 16 to 17. Yeah, so that's like the youngest we worked with so far. Um, but yeah, definitely, you know, in the future, I think we have to be focused for now to say like, hey, you know, we have to focus on, let's say, adult education. But I really hope in the future, as we start to expand, yeah, we can also start taking into account children. Yeah, because the uh, applications are, are endless. Now, I know yeah. that you believe that empathy is a tangible skill that drives your work at Tribeless. What is the main challenge with empathy that Tribeless is addressing? I think it's getting people to understand that empathy is a skill and it is important. Uh, aside from, like you mentioned, the small group of us who already kind of have felt the effects of it and believe in it. Um, It's almost like, how can you make a business case for something that's invisible, right? Um, And I think, yeah, as a small company, as a small business, we are trying our best to stay afloat. And one of the kind of revenue streams that we are, you know, working, like doing our best to work with is corporates, right? And, and businesses. So teams and, and companies do reach out to us to say like, hey, you know, we want to bring you guys in. But then when it actually comes to having to explain this to, you know, their higher ups or to the decision makers, and then something gets lost in translation and then it doesn't go through compared to, I guess, the harder skills, like, you know, like, technical skills or like business skills, leadership skills. So I think a lot along the way, maybe you can resonate with this as well. Something that was so pure and so like integral, like oh, empathy, right? It almost became muddied with trying to figure out the commercial value of it. And I, I would say like, this is the biggest challenge um, that I face personally, because having to reconcile that, right? Like I need to eat, <laughs> my team needs to eat, but you know, is it, Like, is it ethical to look at empathy this way? You know, is it ethical to sell it this way? Yeah, I I would say that's my biggest personal challenge when it comes to this work. For sure. Um, How do you monetize like the scaling (laughs) of empathy? Yes. And in regards to practicing empathy, what is one purposeful action that could get our audience started? Oh, I love this. So if you noticed, I've been doing this a lot, which is kind of, uh, we call it the love card just for short, but there's like a bunch of things. So these are micro skills, we call it micro skills to practice empathy. So I would say um, the best thing that we can do to start off with is when we're listening to someone, can we look for things in what they're sharing that we can resonate with and appreciate? Uh, Because to us at Tribeless, showing love is the first step of empathy. Not only does it build rapport with what, you know, with the person that's sharing, but it also enables you to tap into your own empathy to see like, hey, maybe you and I aren't so different because you're actually actively looking for shared emotional experiences, you know, that you might have in common with what that person is sharing so that you can actually start practicing that empathy in response to them. Um, So something really simple is just like, hey, thank you for sharing. You know, I... I've gone through that. You're not alone. Like something as simple as that, I think it's like a really powerful and simple first step that we can really start applying. Yeah. So as a, as a final thought, you know, the frame that I use is purposeful empathy. And that's because Mm. I think we need to have more empathy on purpose. We are naturally, Mm. we have the natural capacity to empathize, but our empathy can also be, um, Uh, flawed because we have implicit bias or we tend to empathize with people who are more like us uh, and people that we know better. 
So the idea of purposeful empathy is to, you know, set an intention to extend kindness and to really imagine what somebody else's circumstances are. And I think that there's policy decisions and politics and, and ways that we can organize society that we can elevate our, our purposeful empathy. I also think that there's a lot of you know, spiritual benefit around be holding mm. a space for someone and empathizing because it allows us to connect at a really, really deep level where we can sense the oneness yes. that we all share in common. So yeah. I just, um, I wonder if you could share as a final thought um, how you personally um, feel that you have benefited. Because I think if this, if it, if it could catch on through the, the, the sake of benefit, right? Like, how do we benefit from this purposeful en- empathy um, that more people would would step into it? So how have you benefited? Oh my, I'm trying to think of like one example in my life and it's just endless. <laughs> so I, I'm trying to think of like a really good example. Maybe I can, I can refer to like a recent example in my life. Please let me know if this is relevant. Um, so in my team, there's a lot of intersecting dynamics in that, for example, I'm working with my boyfriend, who's also my co-founder, right? Who's also my friend. So it's like just in one person, there's so many intersecting dynamics, right? And this is the same for my best friend, who's also working in tribals with me, my little sister, who's also working in tribals with me. So there's just so much going on. And as someone who, um, I guess, empathy doesn't come naturally to me in that it's not my default response. It, It really sometimes I get stuck in my own head, if that makes sense. And, you know, it's so hard for me to take someone else's perspective and to really understand, oh, wow, they're not doing this to piss me off or they're not doing this to get back at me or whatever toxic thoughts I have, but to really, really see that person as a human being, right? They're struggling, they're going through their own things. And what can I do to empathize with them and make their life better? And I think why process and that that practice has been so like powerful for me is because before this like I mentioned I've always craved for deeper relationships but I really like I genuinely never knew how to bring them into reality in the sense that I would have people around me sure but I just wouldn't know how to deepen that connection and every time I did I would inadvertently end up hurting them and not know why so I was like you know secretly driving people away from me without even knowing the part I played in it. So I guess if you're listening to this and you have ever had an encounter in your life, maybe with someone you love or someone you're close to, someone you're working with, you're having a conversation and there just is a block, right? You're not seeing eye to eye. You don't really get why they're acting the way they are doing and they're hurting you. I encourage you to look at that through the lens of empathy and just like for a second, think about what, could possibly be going on in that other person's life. Because I think that one practice for me changed so much because it created, like you mentioned, that openness inside of me to actually start like (laughs) contemplating, oh, okay, like the world isn't just about me. What are they going through? And that has somehow sparked kindness in me, generosity. I reach out more. I, you know, like, I guess I start playing a more active role in my relationships. And that active role has led to the deepening of my relationships, you know, has led to more connection, more trust, more openness, more honesty. And it's through that process that actually gave me what I've been looking for my whole life, which is that, that depth of connection and intimacy. So (laughs) I hope this kind of answers the question in that, you know, what's standing between you and what you've always wanted in your life? could very well be that lack of empathy. And when you actually start purposefully practicing it, you know, I think a lot of wonders can open up. Goosebumps. What a beautiful <laughs> way to end our conversation. I think you're wise beyond your years. And I wish you Thank nothing you. but success with Tribe Lift through this, you know, tumultuous time. But I think that yeah. um, I, I believe 64,000 feet up that the world needs Aww. much more empathy. And thanks for the role that you're playing to bring that to us. Thank you. Aww. Thanks for watching. See you next time.